Well, welcome. This isn't Yorkshire. This is Souter Lighthouse up on the County Durham coast. Really just because we had a few days up in Northumberland and that was a rather nice photo. I did feel extremely old though. The green door that you can see in front of us is in fact a holiday cottage. And we were the first people to stay at that holiday cottage. It slept four plus cot. So we went back this time with Harry, who then was the cot and is now about to turn 30. So yes, I'm feeling old, but a very nice National Trust lighthouse and they do an extremely good scone. Life is coming back to normal, we can get National Trust scones. All the normal notices, notice sheets on the front page of the website. It is Food Bank Sunday. If you've got anything you'd like to drop off in the shed before Tuesday morning, that would be appreciated. There's even song at St Matthew's at six o'clock tonight. I got told off at the 10 o'clock when I suggested that they get the same sermon at Evensong as Clive is preaching on this Zoom service, only to be told that, of course, he's written two sermons today when the rest of us only wrote one. But hey ho, we, we look forward to it. So thank you indeed, Clive, for doing the sermon and the prayers for this service, and I will do the rest of it. So it's uh, all creatures of our God and King. It's that sort of Sunday. Not really got the burning sun with golden beam, but not doing too bad. So let's have this song and you can sing along with it. And I hope you'll hear everything properly.
grace, <clears throat> mercy and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you and also with you. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, Jesus Christ, to save us from our sins, to be our advocate in heaven, and to bring us to eternal life. Let us confess our sins in penitence and faith, firmly resolved to keep God's commandments and to live in love and peace with all. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate faults. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. <laughs> the collect for this week. Almighty God, who sent your Holy Spirit to be the life and light of your church, open our hearts to the riches of your grace, that we may bring forth the fruit of the Spirit in love and joy and peace. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And the first reading is continuing Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 4. I, therefore, the prisoner in the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, 
making every effort to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. But each of us was given grace according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore it is said, when he ascended on high, he made captivity itself a captive. He gave gifts to his people. When it says he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is the same one who ascended far above all the heavens, so that he might fill all things. The gifts he gave were that some would be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until all of us come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to maturity, to the measure of the full stature of Christ. We must no longer be children, tossed to and fro and blown about by every wind of doctrine, by people's trickery, by their craftiness in deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we must grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and knitted together by every ligament with which it is equipped, as each part is working properly, promotes the body's growth in building itself up in love. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. For the beauty of the earth, for the beauty of the skies. Hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. When the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum looking for Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the lake, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them, 
Very truly, I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For it is on him that God the Father has set his seal. Then they said to him, What must we do to perform the works of God? Jesus answered them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. So they said to him, What sign are you going to give us then, so that we may see it and believe you? What work are you performing? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said to them, Very truly, I tell you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. So now let's hand over to Clive. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. The Gospels for the past few weeks, whether drawn from Mark's Gospel, which is the Gospel of the Year for Year B in the three-year cycle of readings in the Common Lectionary, or from John's Gospel, used to supplement the readings from Mark, which is much shorter than Matthew, which is Year A, or Luke, which is Year C. These readings this year seem to be full of rushing about. We've been using the common lectionary in the Church of England for over 20 years now, but this rushing about characteristic hasn't struck me before. Week after week, we have read about instances where Jesus and the disciples have been going about, and all the time the crowds have flocked round them, bringing their sick to be healed or, as last week, requiring a multitude to be fed. If they take to a boat on the Sea of Galilee and cross the other side, the locals see them coming and congregating crowds on the beach, clamouring for attention. It all sounds exhausting to me, and I sense that the disciples were getting a bit fed up with it. But Jesus seems to maintain his composure and, we are told, had compassion on them, the crowds. When I realised this constant pressure on Jesus, it put me in mind of the health services in Britain and around the world over the past 18 months, as the effects of COVID-19 have led to almost overwhelming numbers being taken into hospital, many with a need for the highest levels of care imaginable. We've seen pictures from inside intensive care wards where staff have been giving their all to save the lives of their patients, and to restore them to health wherever they can. If we needed examples of love in action, we have had plenty to choose from over these past months. And it's not, of course, only in hospitals that such self-giving has been manifest. But in untold millions of acts of care and support, most of them known only to the individuals concerned. Today's Gospel reading begins in just the same way as the others in recent weeks, with the crowds eagerly awaiting, awaiting Jesus' arrival. But this time, Jesus answers them not with a string of healing miracles or a free bun fight, but with a challenge. He knows that the crowd were seeking healing for their sick friends or the miraculous, or the miraculous generation of a free meal and were interested in him only in so far as he could provide these things. Now he urges them to look beyond those material things, to the things of eternity, to the things that were his purpose in coming to live among mankind. I get the sense from the gospel today that the crowd were not that keen on this change of direction. 
but they try to cover up their appetite for more material goodies under the pious form, what must we do to perform the works of God? And then they care even less for his reply and try to challenge him to pull more rabbits out of hats. What sign are you going to give us then so that we may see it and believe you? And then they try to link this with the challenge from their scriptures, our Old Testament. Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness. The implication is clear. What are you going to do to top that then? His answer is to invite them to come to him and believe in him. We're not told what the crowd made of this, but a few verses later we learn that the Jews, the leaders of the people who had heard what Jesus had said, took exception to it. First, on the grounds that he was a very ordinary person. Why? They even knew his father. And then on more complicated theological grounds, beginning to see that his claims about himself are more profound than they had even guessed. Of course, you and I have the benefit of hindsight when hearing these words. We don't have a problem with Jesus' humble origin. And we're not aghast when he says that he is the bread of life. But we ought in very truth to feel a challenge when we hear his invitation to come to him and to believe in him. Because we know that to respond wholeheartedly to the invitation will involve us in life-changing ways of living, not just in some one-off conversion, but day by day by day. Going back to my earlier consideration of the demands that the plague has made upon us in today's world, not all of us have been rushed off our feet caring for others round the clock. Indeed, especially during the times of lockdown, the best thing many of us could do was to stay at home and keep out of the way. Even doing that, of course, there was potential for lending support to others by keeping in touch by telephone, etc. And there also, in theory at least, time for doing more of what Jesus is urging the crowd to do in today's gospel and look beyond our present concerns to how the world might be. Trying to imagine a better world than the one we have known, one based more on justice, more sharing, more loving. Speaking personally, I've done a bit of that, but I have to confess that I've done a lot more of feeling outraged when some hapless government minister has been caught out in some barefaced hypocrisy, or someone in government perhaps has been slow to take hard decisions. In today's epistle, St Paul is encouraging the church at Ephesus to foster the gentle arts, bearing with one another in love. He stresses that they should not allow themselves to be tossed about by every wind of doctrine, and I wonder if it's stretching a point to identify this with the fake news of today's social media that has some folk believing that vaccines are an instrument of control devised by megalomaniac rulers. But rather that they should be speaking truth in love and being knit together into a wholesome community where the contributions of everyone are acknowledged and valued. It is this mode of living that follows on from truly coming to Jesus and believing in him. I hope that our churches reflect something of this mode of life. Pray that our individual lives might manifest it too. In the name of God, Father, Son and Holy Ghost. Amen. Thank you very much, Clive. Let's confess our faith in the words of the Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. 
for us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Before we listen to our anthem and then go into the prayers, just one piece of rather sad news. Most folk from St Edmunds will know John Gear, Reverend John Gear, and John died yesterday. He was in the Macmillan unit at the, up at the hospital. Been at home for quite a while. I took him and Christine communion a couple of weeks ago, and then he went into hospital on Thursday and died yesterday. So we give thanks to God for a lovely priest, lovely human being, one of those nice people that you meet on Christ on our journey through through life. And we obviously hold Christine and the family in our prayers. So I chose this ages ago, but Elgar's Ave Verum really is a hymn of faith, an anthem of faith. So let's give thanks to God for John as we listen to this, and then Clive will take us on into our prayers. Ave Verum Corpus. Let us pray. In this unequal world of mad rushing about for some, and enforced idleness for others, we give thanks for all those who rush about to good purpose, to heal and care for others, 
to produce and distribute food and goods, to keep essential services operating, to rescue those overcome in disasters. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, prayer. our prayer. We pray for those in positions of leadership in the world, especially now as they try to navigate a way through the complexities of the current plague time and the ominously growing climate crisis. We pray that they might have a long-term perspective and a spirit of cooperation to inform their decision-making. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. prayer. We pray for those suffering acutely from the effects of COVID-19. We think of those in the United Kingdom whose suffering is overlooked in the more general tide of optimism here. And remember those in other parts of the world whose suffering is overlooked here because they are far away. We pray especially that vaccines and treatments will be made generally available wherever they're needed so that the world may genuinely get on top of this present plague. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the places and situations in the world where there is strife, unrest, disaster. We remember especially at this time Afghanistan and its beleaguered people. We think on this and at this anniversary time of the explosion in Beirut port a year ago of the people of the Lebanon and how it's a reflection of so much that is amiss in the world with warring factions and weak government and corruption. We pray for the people seeking to build a better life for themselves and for their communities. Remember in a moment's quiet, all those other places where there is trouble. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. in your hour. We pray for the sick in body, mind and spirit. Remembering especially those known to us, those whose problems are on our minds and in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those who mourn, for those at the point of death, and for those who have died. Remember especially today, dear John Gear. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. prayer. We pray for ourselves that we, being fed with the food of eternal life, may live our lives as witnesses to the love of God. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We bring our prayers together as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Lovely. Thank you, Clive. And indeed, thank you, Sophie, for holding all this together as well. Christ is the King. Oh, friends rejoice, brothers and sisters, with one voice.
May the road rise to meet you. May the wind be always at your back. May the sun shine warm upon your face, the rains fall soft upon your fields. And until we meet again, may God hold you in the palm of his hand. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you this day and forevermore. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. So we'll Zoom again next Sunday at 11.30. And just to flag up, we have a book sale in the Vicarage Garden in a couple of weeks' time, two weeks yesterday. We decided to do it in a marquee so we can have lots of fresh air, but hopefully no rain. We're going to have ice cream available as well. So you'd be very welcome to come up on that. And obviously we have a nice big garden, so there's plenty of space and we'll get some chairs and we'll get some fresh air and hopefully have some fun. Now, couldn't find an organ piece for today, but I thought let's have this rather nice recording of, a fi of the final blessing set to work by Gerald Knight. A rather lovely end, I hope, to our service. While we were listening to that, I looked up Gerald H. Knight, because I can't say he's a composer I'd ever heard of. 1908 to 1979, born in Parr in Cornwall, educated at Truro Cathedral School and Peterhouse in Cambridge, was director of the Royal School of Church Music for 20 years and organist at Canterbury Cathedral. I was rather hoping he might have been a Yorkshireman, which would have brought this service round in the circle very nicely, but he wasn't. But he's a jolly good organist and a lovely composer. Hope